All right. Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. I am going to do my review today, and we're going to do it on, I'm gonna share my screen real fast, on polarity, lecture 15. I'm just gonna give me one moment, get all ready. All right, so yeah, lecture 15, polarity. And this is kind of an important subject in understanding how uh, molecules look and how they react with each other. Um, so there's quite a bit we need to cover, but honestly, it's not too bad um, if you can just learn a few things. So first thing we need to talk about is VSEPR, which is valence shell electron repulsion theory. And it's going to help us using that where it's going to help us determine the molecular geometry. So that's how we usually like draw our Lewis structures as different steps. So first step is to draw the Lewis structure. And then from that, we're going to find the steric number. And the steric number is simply just the number of lone pairs on the central atoms and the number of atoms bonded to the central atoms. And it's, we're going to get to some examples later, so don't stress about it. And once you find the steric number, you can find the electron geometry, depending on the number of lone pairs and central atoms and all that. And then from the electron geometry, we're going to find the molecular geometry, which is a little more specific. So this little chart is going to be your best friend through all of this because it has everything that you need to know. Um, there's a better chart on um, Professor Mortensen's lectures that has, it's like just, it's like this, but better and has better visuals. So go look at that if you have any questions, but this one basically tells the same thing. So for steric number, we can see here, I hope you can see my mouse, but we have our little, our little atom here and it's connected to two other atoms. So that's why the steric number is two. There's no lone pairs. So the steric number is two because there's two other atoms. So we take the number of lone pairs combined with the number of atoms combined to it. So there's no lone pairs, that's zero, and two atoms connected to it. So the steric number becomes two. And with the steric number of two, there is only one option. There is linear, that's what it's called. Then if we go on to the steric number of three, we can see here there's three atoms connected to this atom with no lone pairs. So that's why it gets three. Um, so this is called a trigonal planar. And here we have on this other option where we have one lone pair. So we have one lone pair plus the two other atoms. That still gives us a steric number of three. We can see that this is bent or angular. And we'll go into more detail in just a second on each of these different things. But this is just a kind of a general overview. But you kind of see a pattern as you increase in steric number the higher chance you have, or the more number of possibilities you have for electron or for uh, molecular geometry. That's because you can get different lone pairs that affect the molecular geometry a lot. But if we get to number four, um, the steric number four, we can see this is called tetrahedral. And um, that has four connected to it. If we have three and one lone pair, with the steric number four, we get trigonal pyramidal, and it's called trigonal pyramidal because um, it just looks like a little pyramid. You get these three down here and this one up here. And that just pushes these ones up a little bit, so it looks like a pyramid. And then another option is bent or angular. This time you have two lone pairs on the top. And then once we get to five, we have trigonal bipyramidal. Um, that's one of the, all of those, and it's called trigonal bipyramidal because there's three different spots right here, and it kind of makes two separate pyramids if you cut it in half. Um, so you get one on this side and one on this side. The next one is sawhorse or seesaw, and that's when you have one lone pair with a steric number of five. Here it's kind of called a sawhorse or seesaw or whatever, just because you have these two right here, and so if you have it if you kind of flip the picture like that, it looks like you can like teeter totter back and forth like a seesaw or a sawhorse. And T-shape, uh, really original with its name, gets its name from the fact that it looks like a T. That's when you have two lone pairs. Um, and yeah, nothing too special about that one. Um, and then you also have linear as an option when you have three lone pairs and these two kind of just stick on the end. 
And then if we go to number six, the stack number of six, we can see we have four in here and then two on the top and bottom. This is called octahedral. Um, yeah. And then if we go down here, we have square pyramidal, which is basically where we have one lone pair down here. So it just like makes a little square here and with a pyramid with the one on the top. And then with we have two lone pairs. We have a lone pair here, a lone pair here. It just becomes a square basically. And T-shaped, same thing. It just looks a little different because now we have three lone pairs instead of just two here, um, but still similar shape. And then the last one is linear where um, you have four lone pairs and these two are just kind of sticking out on the end. So we're gonna look at the little difference. There's a, called electron geometry and molecular geometry. And we touched on that in the first slide. Um, but the electron geometry, it just depends on the steric number. So if we go back to this, this is always the electron geometry here on the left side. So if you have steric number two, the electron geometry is linear. If you have the steric number of three, the electron geometry is trigonal planar. And if you have a, a steric number four, tetrahedral, steric number of five, trigonal pi bipyramidal, and steric number of six, you have octahedral. So that's good to remember. And the only other difference is when you get to molecular geometry, it changes when you have different numbers of lone pairs. So theoretically, you could have this, your geometry, your electron geometry and your molecular geometry could be the same if you don't have any lone pairs. So that would all be those. But once you start getting a lone pair, it starts changing, even though the static number stays the same. So yeah, here's an example of that. Here we have um, SF4 and the electron geometry of this, if we go back to our thing, would be um, trigonal bipyramidal. But since we have one lone pair here, it becomes a sawhorse. So the electron geometry is trigonal bipyramidal and the molecular geometry is seesaw. So we're gonna to go to a few of these a little more in detail so we can get a better feel for it. So a steric number equals two, the electron and molecular geometry is going to be linear. And the examples of this are CO2 and BH2, just I found on the internet, kind of gives an example right here. And then another thing we need to talk about is the bond angle, which is kind of important that we need to know. So for linear, it's always gonna be 180, as you can see here, because there's 180 degrees between this bond and this bond. So the bond angle is 180 degrees. So linear is pretty simple. But if we keep going, we get SN3, our electron geometry becomes uh, trigonal planar. And this is where things start getting different, where the molecular geometry changes. So it can either be trigonal planar or it can be bent. And um, so if we have a trigonal planar right here, we have 120 degrees, as you can see. This is for BH3. BF3, same thing. Um, the only difference is when you have a lone pair, when it, it affects the bond angle. So for example, SO2 here, you can see here we have one lone pair right here on the top of it. And that changes it because the electrons, they like to take up a lot of space. So they kind of push these two closer together. So anytime you have a um, lone pair or double bonds also do the same thing because there's more electrons in that area. Um, it pushes these two a little closer. So the, elect the bond angle always becomes a little less than the original. So these are 120. If you add a lone pair, instead it becomes less than 120. So it'd probably be like 117 or something like that. But yeah, so that's SN3. You have two options, trigonal planar or bent, just depending on if you have a lone pair or not. SN4, stack number four. So your electron geometry is always tetrahedral and your molecular geometry can either be tetrahedral, trigonal pyramidal, or bent. So tetrahedral, for example, this is CH4. Right here, you can see they're all equally spaced out between each other, there's four of them. And the bond angle between these is a 109.5. And a little different one, if you have one lone pair, so this is where we're gonna get trigonal pyramidal, kind of as you can see, you have like these three that lead up to the nitrogen right here. So it looks like a little pyramid. 
but the bonding on that is going to be less than 109.5 because of this lone pair. See, it says 107. That's what, kind of what it looks like if you were to make a little, this is the nitrogen here, the hydrogens. And then H2O is our example of the bent. Um, so if we look here, we have hydrogen, hydrogen. And then on this one, we have two lone pairs compared to this one. So this is gonna push it even more. So it's a, like less than less than 109.5. So this is like 107, so it's gonna be less than that because there's two lone pairs which push it a lot. So we get 104.45, but you don't need to know the specifics, just that it's less than 109.5. So yeah, there's SN4. If we go to SN equals five, it just gets more crazy the farther you go, but we only have two more, so we're making good time. Um, our electron geometry um, is going to always be trigonal bipyramidal, again, because it kind of makes a little pyramid on both sides of this central atom. Um, and then the molecular geometry can either be trigonal bipyramidal, sawhorse or seesaw, T-shape or linear. So, for example, um, right here we have a trigonal bipyramidal and the bond angles on this are going to be 120 degrees between these ones right here, these ones out on the outside, and then 90 degrees between these ones. So you have two bond angles actually. And then for our seesaw, we have one lone pair as you can see from this picture right here. And um, the seesaw is going to be less than 120 and less than 90 because this one's pushing. So you have your lone pair right here. It's pushing these ones. You can see they're like a little bit back farther than what they're supposed to be. And these ones are pushed together a little more as well. So we have a little less than 120 and a little less than 90. And then for our T-shaped, these ones are always going to be, we have two lone pairs here. So these ones are going to be less than 90. If it was like a perfect T, it would obviously be 90, but since we have these lone pairs, it's gonna be 90 degrees, little less than 90 degrees. And then if we get our linear shape, um, then we're gonna have three lone pairs. So they kind of stick out for these three. These three all become lone pairs instead. And we just have our two elements over here. So this becomes linear. So it's 180 degrees. All right, moving on to steric number equals six. Last one of the steric numbers, our electron geometry is always going to be octahedral and our molecular geometry can be octahedral, square pyramidal, square planar, T-shape or linear. And I'll show you examples on the next slide. There are just too many to fit on one slide. So um, for octahedral, um, I can just show you so it's easier to visualize. But here we have an octahedral right here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, steric number six. And between all of these, it's 90 degrees, as we can see right here. And then if we're going to square pyramidal, here's our square pyramidal right here. You can see there's one lone pair here. And so these ones are all, it looks like they're 90, but this is pushing them all a little closer than 90. So the bond angle becomes less than 90. Um, square planar is basically right here when these two, um, the two on the end right here become lone pairs. And um, yeah, so we just have a little square here. So these are all 90 because the two electron, the two lone pairs are pushing against each other equally. So these two end up at exactly 90. Um, yeah, T-shape is going to be less than 90. I didn't get any examples just because it's not super, super common. And then linear, but we can go back to this slide and I can show you here. So T-shaped, we have these three become lone pairs. We have these three, so it becomes T-shaped, but it's gonna be less than 90 as it says right there. And then linear, these four right here all become lone pairs, or I guess you only have two elements to um, put them together. So the bond angle between these two is 180 because these are all pushing evenly. So, and then, yeah, just to remember, I didn't get any examples with double bonds really, but if we had like a C, a carbon connect double bonded to oxygen with two hydrogens, then the uh, bond angle between the hydrogens would be less than 120 because that would be a, a trigonal planar because we have one, three atoms bonded to it. 
And so the steric number would be three. The double bond pushes the um, the other two closer to each other and, um, and farther away from the double bond. So between the double bond and the hydrogens, it would be greater than 120, but between the two hydrogens, it would be less than 120. And that's how we usually measure it is by less than 120. So yeah, just remember lone pairs and double bonds always make the angles smaller. Good stuff to remember. So once we can do that, then we can get into determining um, polarity. And so polarity, um, again, is important. And we'll, I mean, uh, someone else will cover it when you get into intermolecular forces and other kinds of things. So um, Dr. Morrison actually gave um, basically three things that help you determine polarity. Um, three steps, kind of, kind of like the steps we showed at the very beginning, how we find, oh, let's see if I can get there. Uh, yeah, here we go. So here are the steps for finding the molecular geometry. Um, now we have steps to find the polarity that kind of build off those steps. So just give me one second to get all the way through here. There we go. So step number one is um, we're gonna draw the Lewis structure. That always helps because that helps us visualize the atom and it's easier from there to determine the geometry like we had in the other steps. So once you can determine the geometry, then you can look for the net dipole. And so the net dipole is basically the area where there's a more negative charge. So it can be the area where there's more um, electrons or it can be for a more electronegative, um, a more electronegative atom that has, that takes the electrons. So here we have an example here with um, our favorite water, H2O. So we see these both have positives right here because the, this um, oxygen is taking the electrons or they're sharing them. So the, these end up with a positive charge and this ends up with a negative charge. And because if you know the, um, or the molecular geometry, there's two lone pairs here. So there's a lot of negative charge down here. So we um, draw this little vector or arrow signifying that this has a greater negative charge. And so depending on the polarity, the net dipole needs to be even, uh, roughly even. But in this case, this is like not even at all because this is all going towards this way. So this is non-polar, or this is polar right here. Um, so yeah, and Dr. Morrison, I really like the way he explained it. It's kind of like vectors if you do math. So if you have one going this way and one going this way, they're both going together, then it's gonna be, they're both like adding on to each other, becoming stronger. But if you have like this, a net dipole this way, net dipole this way, they cancel each other out. So it becomes zero. And that's when you find nonpolar things. So here's some examples. Um, see if you can do them. Would this one be, uh, I think this is SO2. Yeah, SO2. Would SO2 be polar or nonpolar? Well, I know the first step, you kind of put it together. You have to find the Lewis structure you find that there's two double bonds here and then S has one lone pair here. So we see these two, um, the lone pairs here, it, it doesn't quite even out. And um, the dipole moment is going up here towards the uh, lone pair of electrons. So this one is polar. Here we have CH4, this is an example we did earlier. Um, this is going kind of a good example with the vectors is that they're all equally pushing towards the carbon. And so this one is going to be nonpolar. For NH3, here we got a lone pair. So a lot of the electronegativity is going this way. So here's like an example of what it looks like. You can see that on these ends, it's all positive right here and negative up here. You can see that it's not even like it is in this one with the tetrahedral. So this one is going to be nonpolar. This one is going to be polar. And now if we kind of put it all together um, here for this last one, let's find out if CO2 is polar or nonpolar. And we're gonna go through all the steps. So first things first is we're gonna draw the Lewis structure. So we have a carbon in the middle, two oxygens. We know that carbon has four valence electrons. So it connects with these two. And as we can see, uh, the two lone pairs on these sides. So from this, you can find out that the steric number is two 
And so we know that if the steric number is two, we know it's going to be linear. So molecular geometry and electron geometry is linear. And so from this, then we can start looking for the, the net dipole. So if we kind of draw the dipoles, we see that you know there's lone pairs on these each sides of the of the carbon on, on the oxygens. And so we have a net dipole going out this way and a net dipole going out this way. And so if we put those together, kind of like the vectors, these are going to cancel each other out so we get a zero. So that's how we find out that CO2 is nonpolar. So yeah, it's pretty simple once you get the hang of it. Um, I would just highly recommend kind of memorizing um, if I can get there. Sorry, it takes forever. Memorizing this chart because this is kind of important to everything that you do with um, determine polarity. So um, take time to look at this. This one has like all the bond angles on it as well. But Dr. Mortensen's is really good as well. There's even one that has like the hybrid orbitals if you're studying that as well. So those charts are your best friends. But um, oh, one more thing I wanted to share. Um, I hope you can still see my screen. How do I escape? There we go. Um, I just wanted to Google and show you like FH structure, we'll say dipole moment. Find an image here. Yeah, so here's a good example um, of F, oh dear, what did I do? Yeah, anyways, you can just see from right here. But um, so F2, because obviously they have the same charge, but H and F have a big difference in electronegativity. And so we see that the um, it becomes more negative on this side of it. So this actually becomes polar, even though it has a, a linear geometry shape. So just keep in mind the, um, what's the word? Keep in mind the uh, electronegativity of atoms as well. If you had like a carbon connected to fluorine, a fluorine and two hydrogens, it wouldn't be as nonpolar as, um, or a carbon connected to three hydrogens and one fluorine, it would be more polar than a carbon connected to four hydrogens. So just keep that in mind. Anyways, thanks for watching this, those that watched. And um, good luck on your chemistry adventures. And yeah, I'll see you later.